Welcome to Statistics in Excel video number 88. Hey, if you want to download this workbook and follow along, click on my YouTube channel, then click on my college website link, and you can download the workbook Business 210, Chapter 9. Hey, we're in Chapter 9, Hypothesis Testing. Now, um, here's the picture of what we'll do for hypothesis testing, and I want you to notice. Uh, it looks like we have some sort of value there and there determining some probability here and then outside there's some probability in here. Hey, this looks just like the last chapter. I'm going to click on this uh, CI answer uh, confidence interval and this is what we did last chapter. We actually did all the steps to define a confidence interval, right? Right here to right here. So everything in between these two things we could say make statements like we are 90% sure that our population value lies between these two values. Now we still ran some risk that our population mean uh, was not in our confidence interval. Remember this was made from sample data. So very similar to what we're going to do this chapter right here. Now I want to go over to the PDFs and then we're going to start this chapter off by reminding ourselves how we built a confidence interval and then we're going to jump over to hypothesis testing and see that it's almost exactly the same. The only big difference is we'll use uh, some different terminologies and we'll make a slightly different uh, We'll use some couple different steps and some different terminology when I make our when we make our conclusion. Now let's go over to our PDFs. Confidence intervals. Remember we took a sample, we built an interval, and then we said something like 95% as an example. We said 95% chance that the proportion mean the population mean or proportion is in our interval. So in essence, we took a sample and made a statement about the population parameter. Now in this case, remember we ran a risk because unless we do the entire population, we're going to run the risk that our interval does not contain the population parameter. So we had a 5% risk that our statement was not correct. Here's hypothesis testing. Here's from our textbooks and later we'll look at um, uh, the more complete definition uh, and a couple other examples of hypothesis testing. But here it is, statistical procedure that uses sample data to determine whether a statement about a value of a population parameter should be rejected or should not be rejected. So this is pretty similar, right? Last chapter we actually from sample data made some statement about the population parameter. Here we're going to start off with a statement, run our tests, and then find out whether the original statement was reasonable or not. Now I want to go a couple pages ahead in our PDF. We'll go to one and then two. This is exactly the same exact example we did last chapter with the, con the solid construction company. Now I'll go ahead and read this just as we did last chapter. The solid construction company constructs decks for residential homes. They send out two-person teams to build decks. The company conducts a sample. Notice the company's doing this this, this time internally. <clears throat> does a sample 40 jobs and calculates the mean completion rate of eight hours to build a typical deck. The standard deviation for the population is known. Now last chapter we did calculations for population uh, mean known, which where we got to use Z. We also did population, I'm sorry, population standard deviation known, we use Z. Standard deviation not known, so we had to use our sample standard deviation, we use T. And we also did proportions where we use Z. But in this case, we knew it. We did all of our calculations, right? Come all the way down here. And uh, it was nice last chapter, and same with this chapter. These pictures tell a thousand words. Here's our interval. So we were 90, um, let's see, in this case, it was 90% sure that our population uh, mean was somewhere in here. We ran the risk that it wasn't, though. Here's uh, a statement we, uh, we made. We are 90% sure that the population mean occurred between 8 hours 47 minutes and 7 hours 13 minutes. We actually converted our, 
our z and our x bar to, to these exact limits. These were called confidence limits. So we had a limit here and a limit here. Now, let's just imagine, and if you read through the handwritten notes last chapter, you already, and if you actually read through this right here and kind of understood it, you already know how to do hypothesis testing. So here's our confidence interval, right? 90% sure that it's in there somewhere, the population parameter. So watch this. If Solid Construction Company claimed nine hours in an ad, we would treat that as the population mean. Now here's, if we ran this as our sample, like we were a consumer group, here's our interval, so we're 90% sure it's there. If they're saying eight, nine hours, is nine hours inside this interval? Remember we got eight and seven, no way it's not. So because nine hours, it's outside our interval, it would not be reasonable to conclude that the population mean is nine hours. The original claim, Remember, we, we changed a little bit here. They claimed nine hours <coughs> in an ad, and we went out and tested it. So that claim would not seem reasonable. That's hypothesis testing. Someone makes a claim, like an ad, we do it in nine hours, or some other. There can be internal claims, too, like for manufacturing, which we'll see. But there's some statement. In this case, it was nine hours. We went out and ran our sample, got this um, confidence interval in chapter eight. So it wasn't in there, didn't seem reasonable. Now what about this one? Solid construction company claims 6.5 hours in an ad to build this deck. So is 6.5 inside this interval? No, it's not. The lower limit is 7 hours, 13 minutes. Now in chapter 8 we called this limits, right? Limits, limits. In chapter 9 we'll call it a critical value. So instead of a confidence limit, it'll be critical value. That's the hurdle there and there. If we get any value outside here or over here, then the, orig the original statement would not seem reasonable. So here, they said 6.5. So we can conclude because 6.5 hours is outside our interval, it would not be reasonable to conclude that the population mean is 6.5 hours. The uh, claim would not be reasonable. Now, what if they claim 7.5 hours and we built our confidence interval based on our sample of 8 hours, right? What was this stuff right here called? This was called margin of error. This was called margin of error, right? Because we're dealing with sample data. So there was our 8 hours. We just added some like fudge room on either side. Margin of error said it should lie between these two values. So if they say 7.5, boom, because 7.5 hours is inside our interval, it would be reasonable to conclude that the population mean is 7.5. So this is kind of to connect us. Here's where we were last chapter. This is kind of like what we're going to be doing this chapter. So let's go over to Excel. And I actually want to uh, redo this confidence interval one, just like we did last chapter. And then we'll do the same exact example as a hypothesis test. So that's a nice way to kind of uh, ease our way into hypothesis testing. Let's go over to Excel. Actually, before we go over to Excel, you can see that uh, uh, this was our visual summary for that uh, Co uh, confidence interval for the solid deck. Here was our 90. Here's our risk that the population uh, mean is not in our interval. We went ahead and calculated uh, from here's our eight hours, that was called margin of error, right? So we had to add, that was our calculation for margin of error. We had to add it to both, uh, subtract it from this side, add it to this side. We got our uh, confidence limits, which we'll now call critical values. Uh, Here's the example. We're going to do it over in Excel, but if you want to look through handwritten notes, here it is, that example. But here's an important thing to realize about hypothesis testing. Statements from the solid construction company. It takes us 6.5 hours to build a typical deck. I don't think I have the, uh, let's try this at 80. So that's a statement we see out there. And now we're going to take some sample data and go and uh, test it. But look, a consumer group says, we don't think it takes eight hours. Or uh, <laughs> that's supposed to be 6.5 hours. There's my terrible PDF uh, drawing 6.5. So the consumer group says, we don't think it takes 6.5 hours. Then they go out and they test. And if we look through here, 
uh, all the hand calculations. Notice uh, we'll draw this picture when we're doing hypothesis testing. It looks exactly the same except for we'll have some language up here about whether we're going to accept the original statement or take the new statement, which the, the original statement is this. It takes 6.5 hours. The new statement is it doesn't take 6.5 hours. And by the way, this first example here, we're just trying to tie what we learned from before to this chapter. This is a, a two-tail test. There's a tail of risk here and a tail of test risk here. We'll also see how to do just um, a one-tail test to the right, which is the upper tail, and just a one-tail test to the left, which is uh, the uh, lower tail. But anyway, our, the point is our drawing looks the same. We're going to have a couple different steps and use some different language. And then here's a list of the exact five steps and how we make a conclusion. All right, let's go over to Excel. And let's start off with our confidence interval and remind ourselves how we did this. Uh, we had a mean. That was uh, uh, in the confidence interval solid example when we did confidence interval. Th this was actually from the company, right? Sample data. Uh, 40 was our sample size. Sigma population standard deviation 3. Now we need to do a couple things before we can build our confidence interval. Standard error. Remember that's the standard deviation of the distribution of x bar. So we say, ah, sigma divided by square root of our sample size. Now if we didn't know sigma, of course we'd use s, not po the, the sample standard deviation. And um, we'd still use the same kind of calculation to do standard error, but we'd use the t distribution, not the z or normal distribution. All right, so there's our standard error. Our confidence inter level or our confidence interval or confidence coefficient, 0.9. So alpha, that's the significance level equals 1 minus this, right? Last chapter we said this is the risk you take that the population mean is not in our interval. In this chapter, chapter 9, we'll say it's the risk that we reject the original statement when it's actually true. Now let's scroll on down here. We're doing a confidence interval or in chapter 9 for hypothesis testing, it's called a two-tail test. So we need alpha divided by 2 equals alpha divided by 2. That just means we have some of the risk in the lower and up, uh, the upper and some of it in the lower tail. Now, think about that. Upper and lower tail. We need uh, two values that will determine the upper and lower tail. Let's go look at our picture from last chapter. Oh yeah, right there and right there. Now, we used both uh, z's last chapter, and we also just cut to the chase and uh, calculated our x-bar. That's how we got our 8 hours, such and such minutes, 7 hours, such and such minutes. But now, I want to take a look at the picture for this chapter. Same exact interval and everything. We're just going to have a different name for this. Instead of uh, critical, I mean, instead of confidence limit, it's going to be called critical value. So back to our confidence interval, uh, we can calculate a, a z lower and a z upper, also called critical values in chapter uh, 9 for hypothesis testing. Now, we have our probability, right? That's the actual amount, all of that right there. So we can just use our norm s inverse to take all that probability on both sides and calculate a, a z, in this case a z. So we're going to go equals norm s inverse. The norm is for normal, the s is for standard, and the inverse will always give us the actual value. Now our probability, this is the lower, so we just take uh, 0.05, because remember the Excel functions always go from the, the low end to whatever uh, x or probability uh, there is. Always from the low end up to wherever that marking point is. So our value is going to be minus 1.64. Now on the upper end we do norm s inverse but we go 1 minus that. That's alpha divided by 2. right? And the reason we did 1 minus is because if we look at our chart it's from negative infinity all the way up to there. So we have our two uh, or lower and upper value. Now our margin of error 
Um, now, last chapter we used the confidence function. In this chapter, we're not going to use the confidence function. We're not going to be calculating margin of error. So I'm going to do this one the longhand way, because remember, what is the margin of error? It's the number of standard deviations above or below the uh, mean. So let's go look over here. Oh yeah, if that's zero on the upper end, it would be like 1.6 uh, for whatever we have times our standard deviation. So the margin of error equals, and I'll just take this z times our standard deviation. So that's the amount we added below and above. I'm going to highlight both of these cells to calculate our, our limits for our confidence interval. I'm going to say equals our eight hours. I'm going to hit the F4 key, and I'm going to minus the slop on either end, the margin of error, and I'm going to hit the F4 key. Now I'm going to control enter to populate both of those cells, and I'm immediately going to edit this and change it to a plus. So we got our 7.2 and our 8.7 hours. And then we made this, this conclusion. The limits for the 90% confidence interval are those two. It is reasonable to assume that the population mean for hours to build a tipple deck is within our interval given a 10% risk. All right, so that's how we did it last chapter. All of these calculations are going to be exactly the same, but we're going to be doing hypothesis testing. Let's go over and look at this sheet right here. All right, that's better a little bit bigger there. All right, the solid construction company constructs decks for residential homes. They send out two-person teams to build these decks. They claim that they have a mean completion rate of 6.5 hours to build a typical deck. Consumer watch grab dog group conducts a sample of 40 jobs and calculates a mean completion rate of 8 hours. Wow, that's a huge difference. That's sampling error. Now the question is always going to be, is that sampling error statistically significant, or is it not statistically significant? Remember, statistically significant means if it's inside the interval but not exactly e equal to 6.5, means there's some sampling error, but it's not statistically significant. But if it's outside, if we look at our picture here, if it's outside here, Remember, because everything from here to you know here, 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 that's all sampling error. But in here, it's not statistically significant. Out here, we have deemed it is. Now, determining that particular risk level right there, we'll talk about more later, but that can obviously have a big effect on uh, what's statistically significant and what's not. But obviously, if it's out here right now, that's going to be statistically significant. That means a sampling error to, uh, doesn't appear to be just uh, uh, simple uh, sampling error, it is a true difference. Now, uh, we're going to know the standard deviation for the population three hours. We're going to see how to do it both ways when we know the standard deviation of the population and when we don't. And here, we're going to have a competing statement. Uh, competing against the original statement of 6.5. And in, in this class, we're pretty much always given the competing statement. But if you're out there conducting your test yourself, you're looking at the ads, or you're working at a manufacturer, and you're assuming that the machine is filling properly. So you will always come up with the uh, competing statement. So here's the competing statement. Can we conclude that the mean completion time is different from 6.5 hours? Now. Probably when you see something like this, or maybe you suspect it's more, we're going to see later how to do a one-tail test on the upper end, a one-tail test on the lower end. We are going to do a two-tail test because we want to see that hypothesis testing with uh, a two-tail test is exactly like, bar slight differences, uh, from the confidence interval. So that's why we phrased it this way. Can we conclude that the mean completion time is different from? Right? So that means we think it's not equal to our original 6.5. Now, null hypothesis is going to be the original statement. Alternative hypothesis is going to be the competing statement. And there are uh, certain notations we're going to use in this class for null and alternative hypothesis. This is step one. We're going to um, call this h sub 0. Null hypothesis. So we're going to say h sub 0, and then we're going to do a space and colon. Uh, 
Now, h sub 0, I want to do two things. One is I want to tell you why we use a 0, and that means there is no difference from the original state. It really means no difference. So we're going to have uh, this statement no different from. And here, we're going to have an alternative hypothesis. So we'll either say h sub 1 or h sub a for alternative. But since this is a sub 1, I want to show you how to uh, create uh, a sub as formatting in a, in a cell. Now the trick is you got to do h zero space colon. You got to leave some stuff afterwards because it's harder to do it and then start typing it. If we did a formatting right here and then started typing, it would all be in sub. So the trick I use is I type some stuff and then I come back and I highlight it. And I'm going to write, there's I'm going to show you two ways, right click and then format cells. Or you can alt o e. Alt O E and then subscript. The uh, right clicking is fine. Um, you just got to be careful that you don't like right click off to the side right here, right? You really want to right click that highlighted area. So right click, format cells, and then you just click sub right there. And then you click over here. Um, and so that's how we're going to uh, do our, hy our listing of our hypothesis. I'm going to hit tab. So the hypothesis is going to be that our mu, mu, that is the population mean. And I'm going to type nothing for the comparative operate, uh, operator yet here. It's always going to be a mu, some comparative operator like equal, greater than or equal, less than or equal to. But I'm going to skip over that for now because that'll be a an important trick to figuring out some of the, the tricky problems. I'm just going to put my 6.5 here in hours. Now, we're going to have a null hypothesis, the original statement, and an alternative. We're always going to use the same format here. So watch this. I'm going to do, always type it like this, and then point to my fill handle and click and drag down. Now, that didn't work because it, it incremented higher, so I'm going to change that. And this right here is not exactly what we want, because this is not the original statement. This is the alternative. Now, there's two types of uh, notation you can use for the alternative. This textbook, um, I'm going to highlight that sub 0 and type in A. That's what this textbook uses. But I'm going to actually highlight this right here like that, copy. I'm going to click, click right there at the beginning and uh, control V. Or, and instead of an A, I'm going to type a 1. All right, and uh, this textbook, the author is going to always use this way. In my notes, I go back and forth. I do both ways. And in most of the places, I say you can do it either this way or that way. This is read H sub 0, the original statement, null hypothesis. This is read H sub 1 or H sub A, the alternative hypothesis. Now, we're still going to have our mu here, and it's going to be 6.5. Now, here's the trick to deciding, because you have to have different operators here. This is one statement. This is another. This is the original statement. Now, the way you do it is you read the uh, Either your statement, if you're the researcher, or the in the, the questions in our textbook, they're always going to give you, can we conclude that the mean completion time is different from, or can we conclude that the mean completion time is greater than 6.5 hours? Can we conclude that the mean completion time is less than? So those are the kind of statements you'll read. And it's easiest to figure out how to set these two up if you start with the alternative hypothesis first, because it'll always tell you which which direction or which type of test we're doing. All it says here is different from. There's no direction here. It doesn't say up or down, less or more. So that always tells you different from. That means not. Now, in the textbook, they use the symbol equal sign with a slash through it. But that doesn't work in Excel. Or there's a symbol for it. You could insert a symbol. But because we do logical formulas in Excel, it's better to use the symbol Excel uses. And this is it. I typed a space less than, greater than. That means not. And that is a much better symbol to use, because as you start to build more and more formulas with if functions and true false formulas, that's awesome to know, because that means not. All right, so that's not. Now, 
it could be if it said, uh, is the completion time greater than 6.5 hours, then you'd put a greater than here. If it said less than, then you'd put a less than, right? Those are the three options for the alternative hypothesis. And again, we'll talk about this more later. And in my handwritten notes, I have a bunch of details of all the possibilities. But that's the uh, alternative hypothesis. Once you get that, then it's easy. You just do the opposite up here. So if this says not, what's this one? Equal. And I'm going to type space equal. Just to show you an example, if this said less than, What's the opposite of less than? Well, then, since we figured out from the researcher's statement the alternative uh, operator here, the, the comparative operator, you just do the opposite here, which would be greater than, but you always got to put the equal sign there. All right, more on that later. We'll stick with this. This is not go up alternative hypothesis first. We come up to the null hypothesis, and we type the opposite. So there it is. Our Null and alternative hypothesis. And in hypothesis testing, these are going to compete against each other. And we're either going to uh, fail to reject the original statement, or we're going to reject the original statement and accept the uh, new statement. All right, now population standard deviation. We know that from up here is 3, 3, enter. Hypothesized value. This is, in our case, uh, um, mean. The, in a textbook, they use value because then you can use this label, for whether it's a proportion or a mean or whatever. But really, this is the hypothesized mu. Oh, it's 6.5 because remember, they said that. So we're assuming that that is going to be the, uh, hypo the hypothesized population mean, which is mu. So I'm going to put 6.5. This is how they describe it. They, they do the symbol mu. I oftentimes write the words because this, there's symbols in inside, of, inside of Excel, but they depend on the font you use. And sometimes that doesn't work on different computers. So I always type out the words mu uh, is O, and that means the hypothesized or sub-zero, that's the hypothesized uh, uh, mu, that's in hours. Now, alpha. Alpha, the smaller the alpha, the more sure you are going to be about your results. And we'll talk about more about that later. It's given here at 0 0.10, which is pretty big alpha. Most of our examples are going to be much smaller than that because we want to be more sure with our tests. Alpha is the risk we run of rejecting the null hypothesis even though it was true. All right, so uh, alpha divided by 2. Why divided by 2? Because if you look at our chart right here, we have some risk and we've got to chop it, chop it up into 2, put some here and some here. All right, so we're going to say equals our alpha divided by 2. Now, the type of test. Now, the way you tell is you look at the alternative. If it says not, it's a two-tailed test. If it says greater than, and we'll talk about this later, it would be a one-tailed test. And notice that symbol like that. Is it pointing this direction? That means the one tail is going to be that way. If it was this one, what is it? The, it's going to tell you it's a one tail. And which direction is that sign pointing? Oh, that way. So that would mean it's a one tail on the lower end. So I'm going to say uh, type of test, it's a two-tailed test. Sample size, so oh, we're given that, I think it's 40, right? 40, so we're type of 40 there. Sample mean, we're given that. Some of our problems, we'll actually get to calculate that. It's eight hours. Now, our standard error, just as we did last time, we take our three, that's the standard deviation from the population, and divide by the square root of our n. Now remember, uh, this calculation is going to be the same whether you know the population or the sample standard deviation. The distribution you use will be different. When you know standard deviation for the population, you can use z. If you don't, you use t. OK. Now on to our critical value, plus or minus. Uh, remember, we need our critical value right there and right there. Same as our confidence intervals from before, but now they're called critical values. So how are we going to calculate that? With our norm s 
inverse. We're given a probability, and I'm going to do the low end one just as we did before. Now I just, uh, actually I'm not going to do that one. I'm going to do 1 minus on the upper end. That way I have a plus or minus there and I don't have to do two of them. Now, in this textbook, uh, there are two methods. And there's two methods even in other textbooks also. Uh, there's a critical value method to run your hypothesis test. And there's a p-value. Now, I'm going to show you both of them in each example. So that will make it easy. Now, let me just remind you that the alpha was step two. Again, we'll talk formally about the steps in the next video. Uh, step three is doing all your calculations and then calculating your test statistic. And then whether you're using critical value or the p-value, uh, then you do step four for critical value, step five for critical value, or step four for p-value, step five for p-value. Really, if you're doing it in Excel, you set them both up and then it's uh, relatively straightforward. Now here's our critical value method. Once we calculate this, we can see our picture here, right? And really, I always draw this picture. If I don't have pictures when I'm doing statistics, sometimes it's very hard to do. And doing it on paper is faster uh, than doing it in Excel. And if you look at the homework examples I, I've uh, posted, I did hand drawings for almost all of the examples. Here it is. We have Once we have our critical values, we draw a picture here. It says, in, within this rate region, we fail to reject H sub 0. Outside, if we get any value out on this side of our critical value or this side, what are we going to do? We're going to reject the original statement and accept the alternative. Let's go back over here. So you have to state this formally. This is the rejection rule for critical value. If our test statistic is not in our confidence interval, reject H sub 0 and accept H sub uh, A. Otherwise, fail to reject H sub 0. If Another way to say it is if the test statistic is greater than 1.65 or it's less than or equal, that's greater than or equal to, or it's less than or equal to minus 1.6, we'll reject H sub 0 and accept H sub A. So let's calculate our test statistics. And we've done this uh, um, a lot. This is calculating a Z. Now, why do we do Z? because z will tell us how many standard deviations above or below. This goes back for many chapters we've been doing z. And on one of the last tests, I uh, emphasized greatly in my questioning, what does z mean? It means standard deviations are above or below. So we say 1.64 is the hurdle point. If we get above 1.64 standard deviations or below, forget it. We're going to reject the original statement and accept our alternative, which is different from our, our 6.5 hours. So uh, that's that um, rule. That's the called the rejection rule. So let's calculate our test statistic, which will give us our uh, z. And then it's easy to see, equals. And remember, we take our, in essence, our sampling error, which for us will be our eight hours. That's our x bar minus our mu, or in our case, our hypothesized mu. And what? Divide it by our standard deviation, which, because we're using the uh, sampling distribution of sample means, standard error. Ding, 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 ding. 3.616 standard deviations above. That's gigantic. So what is our conclusion? Immediately, we can conclude, because 3.16 is greater than 1.64, not in our interval in essence, we reject H sub 0 and accept H sub, uh, sub A. From our sample evidence, it is more than reasonable to say that the mean time is different from 6.5 hours. Scroll down here, and we will do our p-value. Our p-value is probably even a little bit easier than the critical value. And our textbook does emphasize it. And it's nice because you get a probability associated with that. And really, um, we can imagine, if we go look at our picture, what p-value would be. We just got 3.16 standard deviations, right? So our, our test statistic was way up here. Now. Test statistic, that's a z, compared to a critical value, which is a z, right? So we're comparing a z to a z when we're using critical value. Now, p-value. 
See, that's alpha right there. A actually, alpha is uh, both of these together. Now, what if we could take our test statistic and calculate the probability of getting that value or bigger? Or if we were down here, it would be that um, test statistic z value or less and get a probability for it. Visually, p value is easy. If the area for that is less than our alpha, boom, we reject. So really, the formally, the rule is, if we come back over here, and it will be the same wherever you are uh, doing a two-tail, a one-tail to the left, or a one-tail to the right. If p-value is less than alpha, reject h sub 0 and accept h sub uh, a. Otherwise, fail to reject h sub 0. So p-value, we've got to figure out how to calculate p-value. And then it's simple, we just compare it to our alpha. What is our alpha? Point 0.1. And you know what? We already know how to calculate p-value. Let's go look at this picture. If we are going to throw in that z, 3.16 or whatever it is, if we know z, how do we calculate probability? Norm s dist, because the dist functions will always give us the probability. So let's go calculate that. Equals norm s dist. Now, z, if we plop in a 3.16, that's on the upper end. And you remember this function always goes from negative infinity up to whatever value we're throwing in. So we don't want that. That'll be like 0.99 something. We want 1 minus. There it is. 0 0.007, highly, extremely unlikely that we could get a value uh, like 3.16, just very unlikely. So that's very st extremely strong evidence that our original statement is not true. Now, we got to think about this. You got to use common sense. We're going to go over here and look. If we just got a probability, a little teeny, teeny probability up there, we we're, we can see visually compared to this alpha divided by 2, very s much smaller, so we reject the original statement. But we're our rule to make it easy on ourselves is we always got to calculate a p uh, regardless if it's one tail or two tail. So since our original alpha is the addition of both of these, we always have to take our little p for two tails and multiply it by two. So I'm going to come back here. And I'm going to go two times in parentheses. Whoops, that's an eight. Two times that. Now. That's the way this textbook does it, and that's the way a lot of people do it. And really, it's nice because then you have a universal rule uh, for uh, p, this rejection rule. No, I notice I didn't even put any numbers there like I did up here. This is just a universal rule. But visually, you can tell if you had a little teeny value, and this is already divided by 2, you could compare these two, and you would always come to the same conclusion. All right, so our based on our p value, our conclusion would be because 0 0.0 rounded, 0 0.0016 is less than 0 0.1, like by tons, we reject h sub 0 and accept h sub a or h sub 1. From our sample evidence, it is more than reasonable to say that the mean time is different than 6.5 hours. All right. Um, there it is, hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. That was a long video, but it has all, uh, basically everything uh, uh, about hypothesis testing. The next video, we'll talk more detail about each step, and then we'll go on and we'll look at uh, the t distribution and uh, the z distribution for proportions. All right, see you next video.